Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone. I hope you're all doing well this evening or this morning, depending on where you are in the world watching this lecture. I am your instructor, Asadullah Ali Al-Andalusi, and I just want to welcome you again to this course, How to Read Information Literacy for the Modern Muslim. This is Lesson 1. What is Information Literacy? Now, prior to getting into the subject, I'd like to remind all of you that you should have already examined your syllabus video, either in the YouTube playlist or in your Moodle template. So please, prior to watching this lesson, or if you're already watching this lesson, and you haven't watched the syllabus video, please pause this lecture right now and go and watch that video and download your textbook. Both of these are necessary in order to pass this course. All right. So with that said, I'd like to introduce you to this lesson with a quick video, a video that I feel truly encompasses the essence of this entire course and the value and importance of information literacy in the 21st century. And I hope it will give you an appreciation for information literacy and why we are learning about this subject today. And the video in question that I wish to show you is about true events that occurred a couple of years ago and involved a personal hero of mine by the name of Abdul Qadr Haidara, who is the head librarian of Timbuktu. And I don't want to spoil the story, so let's just jump right into it, okay? When Al Qaeda invaded northern Mali, it was only a matter of time before they started burning books. But in Timbuktu, one librarian decided he couldn't let thousands of years worth of history and literature be destroyed without a fight. There was nothing but gunfire everywhere. I was totally taken off guard. I wasn't expecting anything like this. I mean, to be honest, I thought I was going to die right then. I knew they'd be coming for the libraries next. Abdul Qadr is above all a bibliophile. He turned Timbuktu into this scholastic center again. Ever since the glory years of Timbuktu, the late 15th century to the late 16th century, there was a tradition of writing books and trading them, these priceless volumes. Not only are they physically beautiful, but the subject matter, romantic poetry and sex and astronomy and openness about science and mathematics. So this very different strain of Islam, very dramatically different from the hardcore Wahhabi Islam that dominates Saudi Arabia and that the Wahhabis tried to export to Timbuktu. The ancient desert town of Timbuktu is under assault. And in recent days, one Islamist group allied with Al Qaeda has begun systematically destroying shrines inside the mosques. I knew that if anyone was going to be responsible for the manuscripts, it had to be me. Abdul Qadr calls a meeting of his fellow librarians and he says, we got to do something. The first step of the process involves sending volunteers out into the markets of Timbuktu and methodically buying thousands of footlockers, of trunks, the second step of the operation involves packing up hundreds of thousands of manuscripts in these libraries into the footlockers. This has to be done at night uh, because there are Islamic police making the rounds all the time. There was so much chaos and looting going on, left and right. People were stealing everything they could find, so we just looked like all the other robbers and thieves. The third step involves a massive movement of these footlockers from Timbuktu across 606 miles to uh, the capital, Bamako, which is still in government hands, where they can be stored safely. We tell people, climb on. We take you out for free. You got a truck full of 10 to 15 people inside. They don't stop you. They just let you pass on by. That was our strategy. They enlist the support of the village chiefs, stash the manuscripts in various houses right on the riverbank, 
and then boatmen go up the river, making this two-night, three-day trip from Timbuktu. A uh, French helicopter spotted these trunks being carried upriver. The French pilot demanded that the couriers on board open up these trunks to make sure they weren't smuggling weapons. The helicopter pilot left them unscathed. Jihadists enter the government library filled with anger, hatred, desire for revenge, but they see these shelves empty. They didn't realize it at the time, but they were defeated by a librarian. The collection has been moved now to a single facility in Bamako. They're all consolidated in one place. They're in good shape. Uh, they're being digitized systematically, and Abdul Qadr's hope is he can return the books to the libraries that are now sitting empty, padlocked, unvisited. We want to make sure the library network in Timbuktu is rebuilt in order to receive these texts one day when peace is re-established. All right then, so I hope you all enjoyed that video and now have a greater understanding of why I consider Abdul Qadr Haidara to be a personal hero of mine and someone who uh, embodies the importance and relevance of information literacy in the contemporary period and even within the Islamic tradition. Now, for those of you who are somewhat still unconvinced of the importance of what he did, um, allow me to reiterate, sort of to summarize, why his actions were necessary, and how they accord with Islamic values, especially with regard to knowledge and information. You see, many of the manuscripts that he saved preserved the culture and history of Timbuktu and all of Mali. So essentially he preserved and saved the only means by which the culture defined itself and understood where it came from. Had he not saved those documents and they had all been burned, Hundreds, if not thousands of years of history would have been lost, and much of what we understand about the people of Timbuktu and Mali in general would have also been lost. Not only that, but we would have lost important documents detailing how Islam entered that land, and how Islam changed the lives of these people, and how Islam might be used in the future to change the lives of these people. And what I mean to say is that he also saved many manuscripts on the Islamic sciences. He saved commentaries on hadith, he saved commentaries on the Qur'an, he saved biographies about scholars and important politicians, he saved treatises on agriculture and other scientific disciplines that could very well be used to comprehend, to understand Timbuktu's place in Islamic history, thereby not only preserving the culture but also its Islamic heritage, which can now be referred to again to revive that society into perhaps another golden age. We don't know. However, if we lost that wealth of information, that wealth of knowledge, we would never know. Now, unfortunately, if you wish to learn more about these events and this personal hero of mine, not many Muslims have written about these events or this individual. It seems as though many Muslims don't really appreciate what he did, unfortunately. So the only books that we have detailing these events and the life of Abdul Qadr Haidara come from non-Muslims. So, for example, the book The Bad Blank Librarians of Timbuktu, written by Joshua Hammer. Now, I do apologize for the title. I didn't pick out the title. However, due to the fact that Muslims aren't the ones writing about these events and don't appreciate these events, we have to rely on the works of non-Muslims to show us the value of our own tradition. Now, uh, alhamdulillah, you are taking this course on information literacy, so you are the exception to the rule. That said, if you can tolerate the title, I do recommend purchasing this book. I own the book myself, and it's very good. However, a forewarning, there is some Western bias therein. However, it's still a very good resource to learn about these events more in detail. Moving on, I think it is now time to discuss what we will be learning in this lecture. So first off, we will be discussing foundational concepts. Foundational concepts or basic definitions that you need to comprehend and retain prior to moving into more advanced concepts in this course. Afterwards, we'll be discussing information acquisition. Information acquisition, which is basically the process or processes behind acquiring information in various circumstances. 
And this section is about information behavior, how we as individuals approach information and how we acquire it. Shortly thereafter, we will be discussing the Islamic history of information literacy and just some events within Islamic history and how information literacy played a role in developing our civilization. After this, we will discuss in more detail the relevance and importance of information literacy in the contemporary period. And finally, the most boring part of this lecture, I assure you, we will discuss your assignments and the quiz. All right then, so now that we've gone over the outline for what we will be discussing in this lesson, let's jump right into section one, foundational concepts, foundational concepts. And the first concept we should probably learn about is information literacy. What is information literacy? You know, because that's the title of this lesson, is to find out what information literacy is, right? So what is information literacy? Well, information literacy is simply the ability to find, evaluate, and use information efficiently, effectively, and ethically to answer an information need. Again, the ability to find, evaluate, and use information efficiently, effectively, and ethically to answer an information need. Now, that seems simple enough, but this definition can be unpacked a little bit more. However, prior to doing that, I want you to look down below at the fine print here, where it says, Scott Lanning, Concise Guide to Information Literacy, Santa Barbara, Libraries Unlimited, 2012, page 2. And the reason I want you to focus your attention on this is because I want you to know that this is a reference, where I took this information from. So this definition that you see above is directly taken from this reference. And when we talk about information literacy, we're also talking about where we acquire the information that we're using, okay? And I want you all to know that any time that I take from a source directly, I will reference it down below. Not only so that you can go and look it up yourself, but also because I want you to know that I'm taking these definitions from credible sources. Now, there will be times in this course where you will not see a reference, and that's usually because I have not found a definition that I feel is either comprehensive enough or is concise enough for my students, so I actually construct the definition myself based on my own understanding of the subject. And if you still don't quite understand the value of providing references, in the near future of this course, we will be discussing the value of references and why it's effective and ethical to do so, okay? That said, let's go back to the definition of information literacy here, because we need to unpack this a little bit more in order to comprehend it fully. Now, there are some aspects of this definition that we really need to analyze, and the first of those being, the most obvious, is what is information? What is information? Now, some of you may already have an idea in your head about what information is. Maybe you have some background knowledge, or maybe, for example, you work in the IT field, so you have a particular understanding of what information is. But within information science, there is a specific and technical definition of information that we have to follow in order to truly comprehend what information literacy is. And what is that definition? Well, information is simply data which has been recorded, classified, organized, related, or interpreted within a framework so that meaning emerges. Again, data which has been recorded, classified, organized, or interpreted within a framework so that meaning emerges. So, for example, a piece of information would be the following. The year 2020, which happens to be the year that this lesson was published. Uh, that said, this is a piece of information because it conveys the meaning of a place in time. And it conveys that meaning through the framework of the English language as well as the Gregorian calendar. So that leads us to the next question. If this is information, then what is data? Because it appears as though data makes up information. So then, what is data? Data is simply defined as unprocessed symbols and experiences, or you could say raw symbols and experiences. And what do we mean by this? Well, if information is data which has been recorded, classified, etc., within a framework so that meaning emerges, then data is simply meaningless bits or aspects which have yet to be contextualized within a framework. In other words, anything that has no context behind it. For example, the numbers 2020. Now, immediately upon seeing these numbers, you may be tempted to say, this is the year 2020. However, that's not necessarily the case because these numbers have yet to be contextualized. 
they have yet to be put in a framework where that sort of meaning emerges. These are just four random numbers. I mean, they could be the year 2020, but they could also convey other sorts of meaning, like monetary value. For example, this could be $20.20. It could be $2,020. Or it could even convey the meaning of being the last four digits of a phone number or identification number. They could be the middle four digits of a phone number or identification number. And these numbers may not even be in the right order. Maybe it's not 2020. Maybe it's 0202. Maybe it's 2002. We don't know. So until we see these numbers organized in such a way that meaning comes out of them, we cannot say for certain that this is information. We can only say that this is data. And this goes for other symbols as well. So for example, you could have a random assortment of letters, right? We cannot say that this is information. And data is not simply uncontextualized symbols, but can also be uncontextualized experiences in general. So for example, imagine that you go outside because you hear a bunch of strange noises and you decide to investigate. Now those noises you're experiencing, if you have no idea what the context is and you have no idea what they represent, so for example, are the noises from an animal? Are the noises from construction equipment? Are the noises from an airplane? Are the noises from a car? Etc. Etc. If you don't know what those noises are, if you can't contextualize them, then that in fact is simply data. So now that we know what data is, let's go back to the definition of information. So now we know that information is data, or unprocessed symbols and experiences, which have been recorded, classified, organized, related, or interpreted within a framework so that meaning emerges. In other words, information is data that has been processed within a framework so that meaning emerges. Okay? Although I think we've come to an understanding regarding information, many individuals tend to conflate information with knowledge. Especially in the contemporary period when we have so much access to information, many people tend to believe that because of that access, because they have that wealth of information at their disposal, they are somehow knowledgeable. However, this is an erroneous assumption to make, because information and knowledge are not the same things. Let me give you an analogy. Imagine that you walk into a library and you see thousands and thousands of books before you. Now, immediately upon entering the library, you understand all of these books contain information. However, it would be incorrect for you to conflate that with knowledge because you know for a fact that even though these books contain information, you don't actually know the information therein. In other words, you have not understood and retained all of that information. So by bringing up analogies like these, you can immediately see that there's a difference between information and knowledge. So then, what is knowledge? Well, Knowledge is defined as information that has been understood and retained. Again, knowledge is information that has been understood and retained. And in actuality, the definition that I've given you here is a concise summary of the Islamic perception of knowledge, the more comprehensive definition of which has been defined by the contemporary Muslim philosopher Syed Muhammad Naqib al Atas, one of my teachers and the teacher of my teachers. And he defines knowledge from the Islamic perspective as such. Knowledge is both the arrival of meaning in the soul as well as the soul's arrival at meaning. In this definition, we affirm that the soul is not merely a passive recipient like the tabula rasa, which is Latin for blank slate, but is also an active one in the sense of setting itself in readiness to receive what it wants to receive, and so to consciously strive for the arrival at meaning. Meaning is arrived at when the proper place of anything in a system is clarified to understanding. So this is a more complex definition of what I've just given you, and we will be returning to Said Muhammad Naqib al Atas in the near future, especially within this course when we discuss Adab, and he will be brought up as a reference in future courses on the Andalusian project, especially when we discuss Islamic epistemology, or theory of knowledge. So now that we understand information a little bit more, and the aspects of information, how do we understand the relationship between data, information, and knowledge? And for that, I've constructed a diagram, which I think represents the relationship pretty accurately, in that it is really a three-tier hierarchy. So in the middle, you have data. And remember, data acts as the building blocks behind information. It makes up information in that it's like the atoms or the quantum level of information. But once data has been contextualized, once it's been organized within a framework to convey meaning, it becomes information. It transforms into information. So the data itself changes. 
in a significant way, in that now it can communicate something to us, in that now we can understand what it is. And after the data has been given context, after it's become information, then the process of understanding and retaining that information comes into play. And that is when information becomes knowledge. However, I want to be very clear here that the only difference between information and knowledge isn't the content or the substance of the information itself. It's more about the subject who's consuming that information. In other words, knowledge is more about ourselves than it is about the information itself. Because the information doesn't change. The content of the information doesn't suddenly change when we understand and retain it. It's only our mental state that changes. So although knowledge is included in this three-tier hierarchy, it's not really a different modality. It's simply a state of mind that we possess about the information. Okay? So now that we understand data, information, and knowledge, let's return back to the definition of information literacy. However, there's another concept within this definition that we need to further analyze. The concept of an information need. And what is an information need? How do we define an information need? Because we understand what information is now, but what is an information need? Well, an information need is simply a recognition that one's knowledge is inadequate to satisfy a goal. Again, a recognition that one's knowledge is inadequate to satisfy a goal. So what do we mean by this? Imagine that you're driving down the highway, and you come across a billboard. And on the billboard, it says... Six out of ten adults in the United States of America lack information literacy. Six out of ten adults in the United States of America lack information literacy. And this sticks in your mind as you're driving. And when you get home, you decide to go online and type this information in a search engine, like Google, and you try to find any sort of source to verify whether or not this information is correct. And this scenario represents an information need in that, upon seeing this information on the billboard, you had the goal of determining whether or not that information was valid and sound, because you recognized that your knowledge was inadequate. And this is just one example of an information need. In fact, information needs are countless in that they occur throughout our lives. For example, I don't know if many of you have had the same experience as myself, sometimes you may see a check engine light on your vehicle right? And if you don't know what the check engine light is referring to, you will try to find information in order to diagnose the problem and fix it accordingly. And in this situation, you recognize that your knowledge is inadequate to satisfy the goal of diagnosing the problem with your vehicle and fixing it accordingly. So as a result, you'll seek out information to satisfy this goal. So for instance, you may refer to the user manual of your vehicle, or you may take your car to a mechanic. And if you don't have enough money to take it to a mechanic, you may even look on YouTube. Another example that may come to mind are new parents. So let's say that you're expecting to have your first child, or you've already had your first child, and you really don't have any knowledge about how to be a parent. You don't know how to change diapers, you don't know how to make sure that your child is healthy, and because you want to be a good parent, you recognize that your knowledge about being a parent is inadequate. So you go searching for information to make sure that you're taking care of your child correctly, right? So maybe you'll call your parents, or you'll call your brother or sister, or you'll call a good friend who just had a child and has a lot of experience as a parent. Or maybe you'll call your physician. And maybe you'll even go on YouTube and look up videos on how to change diapers and feed a baby, right? And there are a number of things that you can do. But the point of all these examples is to show that information needs are prevalent in our lives. And this leads us back to the concept of information literacy. You are taking this course to help you obtain the ability to find, evaluate, and use information efficiently, effectively, and ethically to answer an information need. Your information need here being to acquire this ability, right? So I want to emphasize that an information need is not simply a recognition that your knowledge is inadequate, but that your knowledge is inadequate to fulfill a goal, okay? And in order to fulfill this goal of acquiring the ability of information literacy, what we need to try to understand first is how do we get from data to knowledge? Not only do we have to understand these foundational concepts, but we also have to understand the process and processes of acquiring information, and what different circumstances are there in acquiring information and the right types of information. And before getting into the specifics, 
we need to ask certain questions. For example, what is each process in every given circumstance? Why is it important to understand these processes? When is it relevant to understand these processes? What sort of information do we seek? Where do we look for this information? And finally, how do we navigate the spaces and mediums where this information is held? And believe it or not, there is actually a science that helps us to comprehend and answer these questions. And that science is aptly called information science. And how do we define information science? Well, information science is defined as the science that investigates the properties and behavior of information, the forces governing the flow of information, and the means of processing information for optimum accessibility and usability. Again, the science that investigates the properties and behavior of information, the forces governing the flow of information, and the means of processing information for optimum accessibility and usability. And if you haven't already guessed, an information scientist is simply an expert of knowledge who investigates the properties and behavior of information, the forces governing the flow of information, and the means of processing information for optimum accessibility and usability, also referred to as an information specialist or information professional. That said, there may still be some confusion here regarding what information science is and what an information scientist actually does, because the definition is quite vague. So allow me to give you some examples of some of the specializations within information science. So among the numerous specializations within information science, I think we only need to mention a few of them in order for you to truly understand what information science is about. The first specialization is probably the most obvious in that librarians, whether they're a public librarian or an academic librarian, is someone who's kind of a jack of all trades. They kind of do everything within the information science field and they can really fulfill a number of roles. So for example, they can work on organizing materials, they can work on preservation, they can also do instruction on information literacy like I'm doing right now. Uh, they can also work as archivists, they can also analyze metadata, uh, they can also catalog, etc, etc. So librarians are sort of the jack of all trades when it comes to information science, and they're the number one example one can use whenever they're trying to understand what an information scientist does. Okay. Next on this list are archivists, and an archivist essentially organizes and preserves documents and materials for organizations. So for example, if you're an archivist for a government, what you're going to be doing is preserving government documents, such as historical documents related to the forming of the country, such as the constitution or the bylaws, preserving historical documents related to the administration, such as when the last president was elected into office, what they did, etc., etc. So what archivists essentially do is preserve the history of the organization they're working for. And they don't just work for governments, they can also work for companies, uh, they can work for hospitals, they can work for universities, they can work for libraries, etc, etc. So archivists are essential to the functioning of any organization, especially if they want to understand their past and they want to preserve the references to justify current actions or current developments. Okay? After that, you have metadata analyst, and uh, we won't go into this too much because it's quite complex, but what a metadata analyst essentially does is they analyze metadata and they also create data about data. So I know that may seem a little confusing, but essentially a good example of this is somebody who creates tags for materials for databases and search engines. So a metadata analyst essentially describes particular works, uh, particular materials in such a way that they can be found. So anytime that you have a metadata profile of a particular work, there are going to be key words in there that allow it to be searched and accessed in such a way by a system. And this leads us into the next specialization, and that is cataloging. And a cataloger is essentially a metadata analyst who works specifically within a library environment. And what catalogers do is that they create and manage bibliographic records and they are responsible for organizing and forming the library's collections and making sure that patrons and staff alike are able to find and access the materials on hand. So to give you a better understanding of what catalogers do, allow me to give you an illustration. And this illustration is from a real life example. And that example is actually one of my homework assignments from my cataloging course during my graduate studies. And it's not perfect by any means. There are some minor mistakes in here. However, I think it gives us a pretty good summary of what catalogers do behind the scenes. So as you can see here, this is what we call a bibliographic work form. And this work form is describing the book, The Poems and Prose of Mary Lady Chudley. 
So as you can see, there's a number of interesting symbols and also various numbers. But I want you to focus on the left-hand column here where there are various numerical designations. And these designations are essentially codes that inform the library database about how to organize and access this particular material. So for example, if we look at the 100 field here, and I won't go over every single one of these, but uh, just to give you an idea, if you look first at the 100 field, this is what we consider the main access point or the primary means by which this work is organized and found within a database. So the main way that we find this work is by referring to the author of these poems in prose, Mary Chudley, who happens to have the title of Lady. And another important piece of information about her is that she lived between the years 1656 and 1710. That said, to define this particular work more clearly, we then move down to the designation 245, which is the actual title of the work in question, and we also include Mary Chudley as the author. So now this work, the title of this work, and Mary Chudley from the 17th and 18th century are directly connected. And if we want to continue describing this work in more detail, we can also include information about its publication, where it was published, what company published the work, and the copyright date. We can even describe the physical aspects of this particular book. And then there's other designations as well, which include more supplementary data. And all of this is necessary in order to really narrow down what this work is about and to coherently place it within the library collection so that it can be easily found and accessed. And uh, believe it or not, uh, cataloging was not exactly my forte. In fact, it was the most difficult course I took during my graduate studies. And it's not something I'm really good at because I'm not really good with like technical and monotonous work. However, that said, um, I do appreciate and am grateful for catalogers. So the next time you walk into a library, just remember that the reason that you can find things and that collections are coherently organized is because you have catalogers behind the scenes creating and managing bibliographic records like this one. Okay? All right then, so let's move on to Museum Curator. I mean, if you want to roughly define them, they're basically like the librarians of museums in that they collect, interpret, preserve, organize historical materials so as to educate the public about general history. So whenever you walk into a museum, whether it's an art museum or a museum of history, Museum curators are the ones responsible for setting up the exhibits and making sure that you have access to these materials so that you may be educated about history. And they also work with fossils as well. So if you've ever been to a museum of natural history where they've displayed dinosaur bones, museum curators are the ones responsible for setting up those exhibits. Okay. Next on this list are accountants. Yes, accountants are in fact information scientists in that they collect, interpret, preserve, and organize financial data of individuals and organizations alike. So yes, believe it or not, accountants are formally regarded as information scientists. And the last two specializations that I mention here, I have gone to the liberty of loosely defining as information scientists because they're not formally regarded as information scientists. And what I mean by that is historians slash bibliographers and archaeologists tend to only be known as interpreters of the materials they have access to. That said, they do oftentimes do more than simply interpret their materials. Sometimes they go out of their way to collect and preserve those materials, especially if they're working for a museum, because there are actually many historians and archaeologists who are funded by museums in order to help with their collections. And oftentimes you may even find historians and archaeologists who become museum curators, or even museum curators who also function as archaeologists and historians. Okay? Now, at this point, you're probably wondering to yourself, well, this is all very interesting, but are there information scientists within the Islamic tradition? And that is a very good question. And the answer is a definitive yes. There are, in fact, information scientists within the Islamic tradition. And if you haven't guessed who they are by this point, the best exemplars of information scientists within the Islamic tradition are scholars of hadith. Because scholars of hadith do not simply interpret hadith. They collect narrations of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his companions. They organize them according to validity and soundness. And they go to great lengths to preserve that material. So in many ways, hadith scholars are the quintessential information scientists of the Islamic tradition. And they also act as historians and bibliographers in that their work surrounding hadith is really the foundations behind how we understand the sunnah, how we understand early Islamic history, how we understand the seerah of the Prophet 
and even how we understand many aspects of Islam outside Revelation. So yes, believe it or not, Hadith scholars are our information scientists, and we will be discussing them in more detail when we discuss the history of information literacy and information science in the Islamic tradition. However, in the meantime, let's move on to section 2 of this lecture, Information Acquisition. So how do we get from data to knowledge? How do we get from data to knowledge? Well, that's a very good question, and the answer is not as simple, in fact it's quite nuanced, depending on the type of information that one is acquiring. Now, before explaining these processes, I want to make clear that information specialists have already offered several models and theories regarding general information behavior, which is the subject's experience with seeking out information. However, we're not going to be discussing those specific theories and their complexities, because that's not really the point here. Rather, I'm going to be explaining how we get from data to knowledge, how we acquire information, and not so much how we seek it, our motivations, etc., etc. So this is a more general, more passive look at how we consume information, and it's more about the information itself than the individual. So the first process I really want to start with is the process of formal information acquisition. So what do we mean by formal information acquisition? Well, when we talk about formal information acquisition, what we're talking about is acquiring information within a formal setting, such as a university or a library, okay? And as a result of acquiring this information within a formal setting, most of that information is going to be formal information itself or established information, information that comes from professionals. So how do we go about acquiring information within a formal setting? Well, believe it or not, we really do not come to acquire and understand this information until very late in the process, because much of what we do within a formal setting is that we are trusting in the institutions that we're learning from to give us valid and sound information. So let's start with somewhat of a history lesson by examining how formal information is fashioned. And where we want to begin is far before our time with the construction of advanced societies. So, several hundreds and thousands of years ago, advanced societies started to form, and these societies began to experience what we call data, okay? Unprocessed symbols and experiences. And in order to understand the phenomena around them, in order to understand each other, even, people had to start developing language and terms in order to describe reality and their thoughts. So society started out by experiencing all of these sounds and images, and especially each other, so they had to start developing means to understand their world, right? So a select group of individuals, usually the community leaders, people within society who are considered to be the most intelligent or even the most spiritual, begin to record, classify, organize, and interpret this data through a specific framework. And they start to transform this data into information. Now eventually, this specific group of individuals start to form a culture of learning to satisfy not only their curiosity, but to also advance civilization forward. So they develop this culture where they start to advance language, they start to advance education, and eventually this culture starts to grow to a point where finally these individuals get together and form a consensus about particular subject matters. And people within that culture become more specialized with the information they have on hand. And at this point, you start to see specialists. But even though they're seen as specialists by the general population, they're not really formalized yet. They haven't been established yet. So we're still in this formative period, okay? We're still in this formative period where people are still trying to figure out what knowledge actually is. So let's say you have a society who has a group of individuals who are really well known for foraging for medical herbs. And they've started to learn through trial and error how to mend wounds, how to heal the sick, etc., etc. So eventually these individuals will get together and they will come to a consensus about what is regarded as valid and sound information, as factual information, as what is regarded as knowledge. And they will get together and form an information tradition. And what is an information tradition? Well, an information tradition is simply the methods by which a culture of learning collects, records, organizes, preserves, interprets, and disseminates information i.e. the birth of expertise. Again, an information tradition is simply the methods by which a culture of learning collects, records, organizes, preserves, interprets, and disseminates information, i.e. the birth of expertise. 
So as a result of forming this information tradition, they have established themselves as the first experts of society. And this tradition is usually about a general subject matter, which can contain a number of disciplines. So for example, the Islamic tradition of information, or you could even say the Islamic tradition of knowledge. Within the Islamic tradition, there are a number of specializations. So for example, the science of hadith, the science of aqidah, the science of fiqh, etc., etc. So this tradition encompasses sub-disciplines as well. But even though a tradition has been formed and the methods have been agreed upon and the first experts have been established, we need to understand at this point the methods that they advance are still mostly abstract and isolated to an elite group of individuals who do not represent the entirety of society. So even though they are recognized as experts, the tradition has not yet really been made accessible to the general public. So even though they may take on pupils, most of their knowledge is still not very accessible. Eventually, this tradition realizes that in order to preserve itself and in order to educate the rest of society, they need to start constructing spaces and mediums to preserve and disseminate this information that they consider factual, that they consider knowledge. So eventually, a tradition will start to construct information infrastructure and information mediums. And how do we define these things? So information infrastructure is simply spaces designed to collect, record, organize, preserve, interpret, and disseminate information. Again, spaces designed to collect, record, organize, preserve, interpret, and disseminate information. So for example, libraries, museums, archives, and universities. Universities often the umbrella for all of the above. And if we examine the contemporary period, we no longer just have physical spaces, but we also have virtual spaces. So the most obvious example of virtual information infrastructure is the internet itself. And even within the internet, there are subspaces. You have online databases and digital libraries, such as JSTOR. You have digital encyclopedias, like Online Britannica. And you even have digital archives, like the Internet Archives, which archives web pages from various websites across the Internet. So you can actually use this to find web pages from several years ago that no longer exist. And speaking of the importance of information infrastructure, allow me to quote the information scientist Lacron Dempsey when he states the following. Archives, libraries, and museums are memory institutions. Their collections contain the memory of peoples, communities, institutions, and individuals, the scientific and cultural heritage, and the products throughout time of our imagination, craft, and learning, and are our legacy to future generations. And I think this quote is apt because it should remind you of what happened in Timbuktu and why the librarian Abdul Qadr Haidara and what he did was so important because he actually saved the memories of an entire civilization and preserved them for future generations. So this leads us to discuss what information mediums are. An information medium is simply the format whereby information is preserved and communicated. Again, the format whereby information is preserved and communicated. So for example, when we talk about what an information medium is, what we mean by format is, is the information physical or is it digital? Is it oral or is it written? Is it a book or a video? And some of you may be wondering at this point, well, what's the real difference between information infrastructure and information mediums? Well, the difference can be seen in two terms. And this is the way you should think about it. Infrastructure are the spaces, and mediums are the formats. So infrastructure is like the library, right? And the mediums are the books themselves, okay? The information is actually preserved and taught through the mediums, but the infrastructure is where those mediums are stored. So that's the real difference here. And uh, some of you may also be wondering, well, well, even though that makes sense, what do we say about virtual spaces and virtual mediums? Are they separated in a similar manner? And the answer is actually yes. Even though it's a little bit more muddy because the virtual space and the virtual formats can often be confused, but in reality there is in fact a difference between virtual infrastructure and virtual mediums. So for example, let's examine the lecture that you're watching right now. Now what you're watching is a video and you're listening to an audio recording, right? This video is an information medium. Now, you're watching it maybe on YouTube or Moodle, and ultimately you're watching this on the internet. So, the spaces or the information infrastructure is YouTube, Moodle, and the internet. So, yes, those differences do in fact exist within the virtual environment also. So, now let's move on to the final stage of this process, which is knowledge. 
So the reality here is that the average person finally acquires this information after a tradition has been formed and infrastructure and mediums have been constructed. Because society requires these spaces and these mediums in order to acquire formal information. And only then does it become knowledge for the rest of us. So even though the tradition itself considers it knowledge, for the rest of society, it's not knowledge until everything else has been established prior. So for the average person, formal information acquisition doesn't really happen until the end of the process. Now, some of you may be wondering about whether or not revelation can be placed in this process, because as Muslims, we also regard revelation as formal information. But we should not call revelation formal information because what we typically regard as formal information is something that is established by societies and generally formulated by human beings. Whereas revelation comes directly from Allah, correct? That said, the process of revealed information acquisition is somewhat similar to the process of formal information acquisition. The only real difference is that there is no phase of data and information Rather, revelation comes down already as information qua knowledge, and it's given by Allah to a prophet or a messenger. And then after that, there are specific individuals who follow that prophet or messenger, and they are the ones who form a consensus about that information, and thus form a tradition. A tradition of information, a tradition of knowledge. So in this case, it would be the Islamic tradition, correct? But in the same way as other traditions of knowledge, these individuals eventually construct mediums and infrastructure in order to preserve and spread that knowledge. So for example, the infrastructure are mosques and universities, and the mediums are obviously books, such as commentaries and collections of hadith. And just like the process of formal information acquisition, we acquire this information near the end. So before going into the next process of information acquisition, I want to discuss something else that is rather important. And that is the veracity and relevance of traditions themselves within the process of formal information acquisition. So as we know, human beings are fallible creatures. We are limited in our knowledge and our comprehension of reality. As a result, we tend to make mistakes in our understanding of the world. And professionals are not immune to this because they are human just like the rest of us. So how do we trust a tradition? How do we trust a tradition's framework in preserving and disseminating valid and sound information? In other words, how can we trust their knowledge if they're just as fallible as we are? Well, the simple and what may be considered a trite answer is that we have no other choice. In fact, there are no other options other than to trust the process because we too are fallible and we have no better means to acquiring formal information other than through professionals and institutions of learning. However, unfortunately, especially in the contemporary period, there are many people who have erroneous opinions about the veracity of information traditions as well as their own abilities to ascertain the information that we have on hand. And what I mean by that is that there are in fact many individuals out there today who believe that because they have a keyboard and an internet connection, they are somehow on par or more knowledgeable than professional academics, professional medical experts, etc. And the reason this is an erroneous opinion is because although we can admit that professionals are also fallible and that they can make mistakes, they're usually less likely to make a mistake because they have more access to information and they have been trained to understand that information properly through a coherent framework. They also happen to have more time on their hands to focus on these subjects, whereas the average person does not have proper training, nor do they really have access to the sort of information that many professionals have access to, despite what they may think. Because looking up something on Google does not necessitate that you'll be getting that information from the right sources, nor that you'll be getting all of the information. And most lay people don't even know what sort of information they're looking for, nor do they know where to look. And the irony is that much of the information they're looking for comes from these experts. In fact, they would not have access to this information had these experts not uploaded it to the internet, for example, through academic databases. So it's interesting when people assume that they have more knowledge or an equal level of expertise as professionals themselves, when in fact they would not even have access to this information had it not been for the tradition which allows for this information to be made accessible online. However, I don't want to digress too much because that's not really the point of this particular lesson, but this mentality will be touched up on a little later and in future lessons of this course. That said, how do we deal with a tradition that changes because it is affected or manipulated in some way or fashion? So let's look at what happens when a tradition is compromised or evolves into something else. So in other words, let's look at what happens when a tradition changes. 
Now, there are a number of ways that a tradition can change, but the two main ways are internally and externally. So what does it mean when a tradition changes internally? Well, what we mean by this is that it changes through abstract ideas. So when a tradition is established, it has a particular framework through which it interprets, preserves, and disseminates information. Now, as a result of being constructed by human beings, a framework is obviously flawed in that it doesn't take into account data or information it has yet to experience that may contradict its overall conclusions or findings. So as a result, the future always tells us that this framework can be challenged and eventually modified or even discarded altogether. So what do we call this data or information that can influence a tradition? We call these influencing factors anomalies. And how do we define an anomaly? What is the technical definition of an anomaly? Well, an anomaly is simply something different, abnormal, peculiar, or not easily classified. Again, something different, abnormal, peculiar, or not easily classified. So these anomalies are simply data or information that the tradition has yet to experience and cannot fit within its framework in any coherent fashion. In other words, the anomalies undermine the framework's general conclusions and its predictive power. And as a result of this, some of the professionals within the tradition start to question the framework and whether or not it needs to be changed. So usually this occurs when one or two or more individuals examine this data or information that they come across and cannot explain it on the basis of the standard framework. So what they do is they try to modify the current framework, or they even try to replace the framework entirely. And if they're successful in doing so, what occurs is what we call a paradigm shift. So what is a paradigm shift? Well, before talking about a shift in paradigm, we need to talk about what a paradigm is. But what is the technical definition of paradigm? Well, a paradigm is simply a philosophical and theoretical framework of a scientific school or discipline within which theories, laws, and generalizations, and the experiments performed in support of them are formulated. And this term was actually coined by the philosopher Thomas Kuhn in his famous work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And he also referred to it as a disciplinary matrix. And just to let you know, we will be discussing Thomas Kuhn in more detail throughout many courses here on the Andalusian Project, especially when we start discussing epistemology and the philosophy of science. So now that we know what a paradigm is, what is a paradigm shift? Well, a paradigm shift is simply the successive transition from one paradigm to another via intellectual revolution. Again, a paradigm shift is simply the successive transition from one paradigm to another via intellectual revolution. And as a result of this paradigm shift, new individuals are considered professionals, and the infrastructure itself also adapts to this change by changing textbooks and incorporating new administration and specialists, etc., etc., to replace the old guard. And as a result, what was considered knowledge before is now regarded as obsolete, and the new information is considered knowledge. And that knowledge leads to a restructuring of the tradition itself. And that tradition now regards the new paradigm as a standard paradigm. And so the cycle sort of starts over again. Now, there's another way that a paradigm shift can occur, and that is externally. And what do we mean by externally? Well, in other words, a tradition can be forced to change based on some sort of physical external factor, such as politics or war. So, for instance, a government who controls the education system can fire professionals, and it may even outlaw an entire framework if it feels that a tradition is a threat to its power. Or it may influence a tradition through, say, funding to force an artificial paradigm shift for its own benefit. And a military conflict can do likewise. But what a government and a war can also do is not create a paradigm shift, but it can also try to completely destroy a tradition. And how do they go about doing this? Well, believe it or not, it's not simply by killing the professionals within a tradition, but by destroying the legacy of the tradition itself. And how does it go about doing that? Well, when a government or military really wants to control a society or destroy its culture and its people, the first thing that it will do is that it will try to destroy its memories and bury its intellectual and technological achievements. And how does it go about doing this? Well, that's when a military or government conducts libricide. And what is libricide? Well, libricide is the systematic destruction of information mediums and infrastructure, often practiced as a part of ethnocide. Again, 
the systematic destruction of information mediums and infrastructure, often practiced as a part of ethnocide. So essentially burning down libraries and destroying manuscripts and artifacts and anything else they can get their hands on. And usually this is the beginning stage of a genocide. So the most prominent example of that being within Islamic history is when Al-Andalus was finally conquered in the 16th century by the Christian armies. And what they did was they started burning books. And uh, many civilizations in the past have actually practiced this as a form of destroying their enemies by destroying their memories. Because even if you kill people, if they have their memories, they have a link to the past. But if you remove a people's history and you remove their identity, what you're essentially doing is that you're causing cultural amnesia. And if you remove the memories of people, especially people who have been oppressed or destroyed, what then occurs is that they have no need for revenge and they have no need to revive themselves as a civilization because they don't even remember who they are. And as a result of that, the government or military in power can now write history as it sees fit, even to the point where they blame the victim. And it's even practiced by terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda, as you may recall what happened in Timbuktu. All right then, so let's move on to the final process of information acquisition, and that is the process of informal information acquisition, or what you could also call general information acquisition, or everyday information acquisition. So basically how we acquire information in an informal setting, in a non-academic, non-professional environment. And in these sort of settings, we can acquire all sorts of information, whether it be from professionals or non-professionals. However, it takes a little bit more effort because now we're not being taught, we're not being fed information from a tradition. Rather, we are bombarded by information from various sources in our daily lives, and we have to put more effort into ascertaining the validity and soundness of that information. And for the most part, you are taking this course to understand how to find and process information in this sort of setting. All right, so let's start from the very beginning. And the first part of this process is that we come across information sources, whether actively or passively. So the first part of this process is an information source. We experience an information source. And what is an information source? Well, an information source is simply a source from where information is received. Again, an information source is a source from where information is received. And we're discussing information sources more in the process of informal information acquisition because this is where the question of sources becomes more predominant, especially when we're outside of a professional environment because, as I said earlier, in a professional environment, most of the sources that we get a hold of are usually guaranteed to provide valid and sound information, or in the very least, we are given support by professionals to find valid and sound information. Whereas in an informal setting, the nature of sources has to be judged by ourselves. And that's the reason we're emphasizing it more in this process than in the previous ones. So what are some categories of information sources? Well, there are three main categories, and they are primary, secondary, and tertiary. And what do these mean? Well, a primary source is simply first-hand information. A secondary source is information about the primary source. And tertiary is information that summarizes primary and secondary sources. And here are some examples. A primary source would be like personal letters written by a historical figure such as Salahuddin. A secondary source would be more like a biography about Salahuddin, talking about his experiences and what he did. And an example of a tertiary source would be an encyclopedia entry about Salahuddin. And an information source doesn't just have categories, but it also has classes. And these classes should be familiar to you in that this is how we similarly describe the processes that we're discussing in this lecture. And the classes are formal and informal information sources. And what are formal and informal information sources? Well, you should already know that a formal source is academically or professionally recognized, and an informal source is a non-academically or non-professionally recognized source. So, for example, a formal information source would be a textbook on entomology or the study of insects. And the example of an informal source would be the personal blog of an insect enthusiast, right? Because a textbook on entomology is academically recognized, whereas a personal blog is simply, well, a personal blog. Now, if it were a personal blog of a entomologist who is in the field reporting their findings, then it may be regarded kind of 
enters more of a gray area because that individual is simultaneously an expert, but the format that they choose to present their findings on isn't academically recognized. It's not considered one of the formal mediums. So there is a little bit of a gray area there. So now that we understand what an information source is, what happens after that? Well, after experiencing an information source, for example, say watching the news, imagine that you're watching CNN or Al Jazeera and you come across a news story, okay? And it's information that you have not been aware of before, and they are presenting stories about what's happening in the world. Now, there's a number of ways we can deal with this information, but generally speaking, the next part of the process is that we recognize that our knowledge is inadequate especially when we're reading news, whether it's on TV, YouTube, or social media in general, what occurs is that we recognize that our knowledge about the information coming from that source is inadequate, and perhaps we want to know more. So with the goal in mind of learning more about what happened, the obvious next phase in this process is information seeking. And what is information seeking? Well, information seeking is a conscious effort to acquire information in response to a need or a gap in one's knowledge. Again, information seeking is a conscious effort to acquire information in response to a need or a gap in one's knowledge. So as a result of seeking, we then attempt to satisfy the goal that we have in mind, whether it's to ascertain the validity of the information we've received, or to learn more about that information, and of course the final phase is knowledge. Now, this seems like a very simple process, but there's actually a lot more here because there are a number of speed bumps that can occur along the way. So this seemingly simple process can become rather complex very quickly. And what do we mean by that? Well, in the information seeking phase, something may occur that leads us in the wrong direction. And that is something that affects all of us, which is misinformation. And what is misinformation? Well, misinformation is simply incorrect or misleading information. Again, misinformation is simply incorrect or misleading information. So, for example, imagine that you're going through your Facebook feed and you come across a news article from an unrecognized source, but you notice that it's going viral. You notice that this story is going viral, and the story is about the discovery of a new primary color. And for those of you who read the first chapter of your textbook, you'll understand the history of this story and uh, how far it actually went. So the story is about a new primary color that has been discovered. So after seeing this, you recognize that your knowledge is inadequate, and you want to learn more. You want to find out if this information is actually valid and sound. So you go seeking information. And in the process of seeking information, you decide to go on Google, and you happen to come across a source that seems to verify the previous source that you were reading on Facebook. However, unbeknownst to you, because you're not really trained to find information, to verify information, this source is simply copying from the previous source and spreading a false narrative. And instead of checking other sources, you are content with what you have read, and you have therefore consumed misinformation, which does not lead to knowledge. So instead of recognizing that this is misinformation, you instead believe the misinformation and are led astray. However, running into misinformation is not the only thing that can happen during this process. So something else that can occur is that our own biases can play a role in not only whether or not we receive valid and sound information, but also whether or not we get through the process to begin with. So for example, when coming across information, we can also go through something called cognitive dissonance. And what is cognitive dissonance? Well, cognitive dissonance is the state of discomfort felt when two or more modes of thought contradict each other. The clashing cognitions may include ideas, beliefs, or the knowledge that one has behaved a certain way. Those who experience this feeling may actively avoid processing information that conflicts with their beliefs. Again, cognitive dissonance is the state of discomfort felt when two or more modes of thought contradict each other. The clashing cognitions may include ideas, beliefs, or the knowledge that one has behaved a certain way. Those who experience this feeling may actively avoid processing information that conflicts with their beliefs. So, for example, if you come across a source that is distributing information that contradicts your beliefs, some may react to that not by triggering an information need and seeking out whether or not this information is valid and sound, or even trying to learn more about this information, but they may actively dismiss the information and the source in order to protect themselves from going through this process and potentially changing their minds or doubting their beliefs. 
And usually the reason people do this is because they feel a sense of discomfort from going through this process. And a lot of people prefer to just simply believe what they believe and not be challenged about it because it does sometimes take a lot of effort and time to examine their own beliefs, to examine the validity and soundness of information, and to process that information in such a way that they may challenge their own beliefs. So it's really a defense mechanism from feeling discomfort with the information that they come across. And one of the things that this course wishes to prevent is cognitive dissonance, because every single day we may come across information that contradicts our beliefs, but in order to truly relieve your doubts, sometimes the best thing to do is to go through this process. Now another bias that many people may have is what we call the Dunning-Kruger effect, and this mentality is the one that we were discussing prior regarding the sense of confidence that people have in ascertaining information and this assumption that they are somehow on the same level as experts. So how exactly do we define the Dunning-Kruger effect? Well, the Dunning-Kruger effect is defined as a cognitive bias in which people wrongly overestimate their knowledge or ability in a specific area. This tends to occur because a lack of self-awareness prevents them from accurately assessing their own skills. Again, a cognitive bias in which people wrongly overestimate their knowledge or ability in a specific area. This tends to occur because a lack of self-awareness prevents them from accurately assessing their own skills. And unfortunately, this is one of the primary cognitive biases in the contemporary period, and it's something we'll be discussing in more detail later on in this course. And one of the other speed bumps that may occur during this process is that after experiencing information from a source, recognizing that you have a need, and then going to seek information, because of your inability to find the right information, you may simply not know whether or not the information on hand is in fact valid, sound, and whether or not you've fulfilled your information need is largely undetermined. So all of these can be blockers in this process. That said, there is another way that this process can go, especially when we're talking about data. And remember, data is unprocessed symbols and experiences. So if you remember the example we gave earlier regarding the noises that you hear outside of your house, you can come to the conclusion that you have an information need and then go about seeking what this data is. At the same time, however, you could be so discomforted by the idea of finding out what that data is that you actually refuse to even engage with it. But an even more rare occurrence is that you may experience data that has yet to be processed by anyone. And this is a rare occurrence because usually discovering new data and transforming it into information occurs by professionals, especially when we talk about scientific discoveries. And even then, when somebody assumes that they've discovered something new, it tends to be misinformation because they've misjudged that the data has already been processed by professionals. However, in the event that they do discover something new, the data that they have processed into information becomes knowledge and then becomes integrated into formal sources. So to give you an example of how this might work, imagine that you are an insect enthusiast and you run a blog about your love of insects, okay? And so one of the things that you love to do is that you enjoy collecting and studying beetles. And uh, the reason I bring this example up is because when I was younger, I actually enjoyed collecting and studying insects. That said, even though it's not my career choice, I still find insects interesting. But let's just imagine for a moment that this is the first time you've come across this sort of beetle and you don't know what it is. So although you recognize it as an insect, it really is a form of data because you have yet to really classify what type of beetle this is. So recognizing that you have a need to understand what this beetle is, and that you don't have the information to fulfill this goal, you can do one of two things. Now, first off, you probably go seeking information. But let's assume you've already done this, and you've come to the conclusion that this beetle has never been discovered before until you came upon it. Okay, and as a result of that, you decide that you're going to classify this beetle yourself, and you're going to submit your classification to, say, the Foundation of National Science or something. So you classify this beetle as the Salahuddin beetle. And then you submit your findings to the National Association, and they recognize your discovery, and that becomes actual knowledge that is then integrated into formal sources. Now the other thing that could possibly happen is that this beetle has already been discovered, therefore the information you've constructed is actually misinformation and is not true knowledge, right? So I think these processes are sufficient for you to understand how we acquire information and the obstacles towards acquiring information so now let's move on to the history of information literacy within the Islamic tradition.
So let's begin to discuss the history of information literacy within the Islamic tradition and within the history of Islamic civilization. And the reason we're talking about information literacy within Islamic history is because I want you to understand its importance towards the development of the Islamic tradition as well as Islamic civilization in general. So I think the best place to start first would obviously be with the advent of Islam itself through the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this period is what we consider the formative period for information literacy within the Islamic tradition and Islamic civilization overall. And what I mean by this is that this is the first time that revelation is given to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and not only is he learning directly from Allah subhanahu wa taala, but he must preserve and teach the information that is being given to him. And as a result of this, he fashions a culture of learning among his companions, because what the companions were doing at the time is that they were not only memorizing the Quran, but some of them were even recording some of the actions and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad himself sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And of course, those records and those memories would eventually become what we know now as hadith. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam began this culture of learning, began this tradition of information literacy between himself and his companions, and the preservation of information was integral to the beginning of the tradition as well as the beginning of Islamic civilization. And the importance of information literacy is even emphasized in the Quran itself. So, for example, if we take some excerpts from the Revelation, we find a number of instances where it mentions knowledge, the importance of knowledge, and the importance of learning information from the right sources. So, for example, in the Quran, Surah 21, Ayah 7, we find the following. And we sent not before you, O Muhammad, except men to whom we revealed the message. So ask the people of the message if you do not know. So the Quran is instructing people to learn from people of knowledge, from people who are considered authorities on a particular subject matter. And there are other places in the Quran as well that also emphasize the preservation and dissemination of information. So, for example, in Surah 9, Ayah 122, we find the following. And it is not for the believers to go forth to battle all at once. For there should separate from every division of them a group remaining to obtain understanding in the religion, and warn their people when they return to them so that they might be cautious. And what we have here is an ayah that not only discusses the methods of warfare, but alongside that we also have a command here to preserve and disseminate knowledge of the religion itself. And the reason I find this rather fascinating is because, you know, there are many people out there who accuse Islam of being this very warlike religion and that it's all about war and destruction and violence. And that's a pretty nonsensical opinion and we won't be discussing it in too much detail here. But what I find ironic about that is that within this very ayah about battle, about the potential for warfare, it gives equal if not more weight to the preservation and dissemination of knowledge within the religion. In that it tells the believers that some of them should stay behind because knowledge needs to be protected. So here we have a direct command from the Qur'an itself, from Allah, that the believers need to give just as much importance not only to the protection of themselves through military combat, but they also need to protect the knowledge within that community. They need to protect their memories and the intellectual tradition of Islam. So I find this a really fascinating ayah in that information literacy, the preservation and dissemination of information, is so highly emphasized as integral to the survival of Islamic civilization. So after a number of years of the Prophet's ministry, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, he eventually passed away. And it was during this time that the Muslim community was put into a great deal of chaos in that they didn't really know who was going to be the next leader of their community to preserve the religion, to preserve the society they had developed. And eventually a successor, or a caliph, was chosen to lead the Muslim community. And of course the first caliph was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And what's interesting is that from this point forward, those who had been recording the Prophet's actions and sayings, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they started to pass this information down to their family members and to other believers within the community. So this culture of learning continued, and a tradition of knowledge, a tradition of information started to be formed. And within this tradition were compilations of hadith which also emphasize information literacy. So for example, if we look within the hadith compilation of Sahih Muslim, we find the following. Abdullah narrated it on the authority of his father Yahya, knowledge cannot be acquired with sloth. And sloth is just a word for laziness or lack of motivation to do something. In other words, you cannot acquire knowledge without any effort to verify sources or to seek whether or not information is valid and sound. So in other words, you cannot have knowledge without information literacy. And another hadith is really interesting in that it doesn't really speak about information literacy per se, but it's more of a passive hint. So this hadith states the following. Narrated Yazid bin Umayra, 
When death was upon Mu'ad bin Jabal, it was said to him, O Abu Abdurrahman, advise us. So he said, Indeed, knowledge and faith are at their place. Whoever desires them shall find them. And he said that three times. And seek knowledge from four men. And he mentions these men who were companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And these individuals were considered authorities within that culture of learning that had been developed. So here we see that he's not only informing people that they need to seek knowledge with effort, but to seek it from the right sources, the right authorities on this subject matter. So here we see him emphasizing information literacy. And this is not all that surprising because eventually these sentiments, this understanding of knowledge, expanded out into the rest of the Muslim community and caused a number of events to occur within the tradition and Islamic history in general. And what do we mean by that? Well, let's skip ahead a couple of years to the reign of the third caliph of Islam, Uthman bin Affan. And the reason Uthman is a good example here is because he's technically the first patron of the preservation of information within Islamic history. So essentially, he was the first to provide government support and funding towards the project of codifying the Qur'an into the standard mushaf that we have today. And the reason he did this was because during his reign, many of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were starting to pass away, either because of military conflict or illness or simply old age. And the reason this was problematic is because many of them memorized the Qur'an by heart, and the only preservation of the Qur'an up until that point was through memorization. So he decided to create a fail-safe program that would continue the preservation of the Qur'an that would transcend the lives of these particular authorities. So he formed a committee to bring together all of the known versions or the compilations of the Qur'an because at the time it was not organized in the same manner across different regions and between different individuals. So he decided to compile all of the manuscripts that were available as well as to gather all of the remaining authorities on memorizing the Qur'an and to make sure essentially to oversee and validate this codification effort. So in summary, Uthman became the first patron of the preservation of information within the Islamic tradition and Islamic history. So without his patronage and the efforts of the community at the time, we would not have the standardized Qur'an that we have today. Now if we jump a couple of decades into the future, we see the beginning of an event that is triggered by another patron of information literacy, and that is the Caliph Abdul Malik bin Marwan. And what he essentially did was that he noticed the surrounding empires that were hostile to the newly established Islamic empire had their own currency, and the Muslims at the time were borrowing that currency as an essential part of their economy. And this was quite problematic because you can't simultaneously be attacking your enemies while using their currency because they can eventually bankrupt you by controlling the value of that currency, correct? So he decided that it would be best if the Islamic Empire began to mint its own currency. However, there was a bit of an obstacle towards this in that the early Muslims didn't really know how to mint currency. They didn't really know the science of what we call alchemy. And this is the science that had to deal with melting metals and fashioning weapons and currency and other sorts of materials that were needed. So he basically told his aides that he wanted to collect and begin translating Greek and Persian works that taught alchemy. And this is what we call the beginning of the translation movement. And the reason this is important is because the translation of books on alchemy eventually led the Muslims, especially within the government, to start translating other Greek and Persian works on science and mathematics and philosophy, etc., etc. Because the early Muslims understood that there was a wealth of knowledge hidden within these books, despite the fact that the metaphysical views or the religious views held by those who initially wrote them were not in concordance with the values and beliefs of the Muslim population. And the reason I bring this up is because I think it's really fascinating if you compare the early Muslim community, who was far more religious than the contemporary Muslim community, and you compare their mentality with the Muslims of today, you see a very stark difference in that back then, Muslims were not afraid to read other materials, to learn other languages, to understand the beliefs and practices of other civilizations and religions. In other words, they were so confident in their Islam, in their own beliefs and values, that they were willing to dig through hundreds and thousands of works of individuals they considered to be non-believers just so they could gather that knowledge within, the knowledge they felt that Allah had gifted them with. So essentially they understood that despite the fact that the overarching systems that these people believed in were false, that there was still truth to be found within them to some degree. 
Whereas today you have a lot of Muslim leaders and even spiritual guides who protest the reading of anything outside of the Islamic tradition, who literally try to ban books and materials that they consider to be heretical or lead to disbelief because they somehow feel that if Muslims are to read these materials or to learn certain subject matters, they will lose their faith. But in the past, the early Muslim community actually embraced reading different ideas and beliefs because they weren't afraid. They did not feel this inferiority complex when it came to learning and acquiring and preserving and disseminating information. And I think it also had to do with the fact that information literacy was such a necessary skill that they emphasized. And alongside this mentality was also the way in which they collected, recorded, and tried to preserve this material for the masses. Speaking of these historical methods, the Islamic Studies professor, Angelica Neuwirth, stated the following in an interview by Louis Gropp. For a very long time, the Islamic culture of knowledge was far superior to that in the West or outside the Islamic world as a whole. This was not least the result of the fact that the Islamic culture was more advanced in terms of media. For example, paper was being manufactured in the Islamic world since as far back as the 8th century or the 700s. This in turn made it possible to disseminate huge amounts of text, which was definitely not the case in the West at the time. Without a doubt, more than 100 times more Arabic text were brought into circulation during this period than was the case in the West. Right up until the 15th century, or the 1400s, people in the West relied on parchment, which was very expensive and hard to come by. So essentially, the Muslims had not only developed a culture of learning, but they eventually developed the technology to facilitate this culture. So for the early Muslims, the sciences were really just a tool in order to facilitate and manifest their own values. Now let's move on to the 8th century, starting in 717 CE with the Caliph Omar Abdulaziz, or Omar II, and he is another patron of information literacy in that he ordered the codification of the Sunnah, or what we know today as the Sirah and the collections of Hadith. And shortly thereafter, around 719-720 CE, a scholar by the name of Shihab al-Zuhri was able to complete this request with one of the first known compilations of hadith and various anecdotes of Muhammad's life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the process of codifying these things, he laid the groundwork for the methodology of tracing and validating narrations. So essentially, al-Zuhri has come to be known as the founder of the sciences of hadith and sirah. And technically, he would be considered the very first information scientist of the Islamic tradition. And of course, there were other Muslim information scientists prior, but none at this point within the field of Islamic science. Now, there are some other events that I briefly want to go over that play a part in the Islamic history of information literacy. So, for example, if we jump about a decade or so, that is when the famous Tunisian mosque, Al Zaytuna, was built and eventually became a major library. And it is considered to this day to be one of the oldest libraries in existence. And for those who don't know, uh, libraries back then were also where major scholars studied. And one of the most famous scholars in Islamic history, by the name of Ibn Khaldun, also considered the father of sociology, he actually studied and wrote many of his major works in this mosque. Now, if we move ahead about 50 years or so to 7080 CE, the famous jurist and one of the four great imams, Imam Malik, authored his Muatta, which was essentially an effort at codifying Islamic law with the use of hadith. So it's essentially considered one of the first major works on fiqh, and to this day, especially within the Maliki Madhab or Maliki school of jurisprudence, one of the most authentic sources within the Islamic sciences. So let's move into the 9th century, and this is where things start to get even more interesting, in that for most historians, the beginning of the 9th century is what marked the advent of the Golden Age of Islam. And for the most part, the reason why many historians consider this to be the beginning is because this is when the House of Wisdom in Baghdad was built and established as one of the greatest libraries and universities the world has ever seen. And many of the great Islamic scientists studied here and discovered many things in this very institution. Now, personally, I would mark the beginning of the Golden Age a little bit farther back at the beginning of the translation movement, because that's what really got everything started with scientific productivity and intellectualism within the Muslim world. However, just for the sake of convenience, we will follow the mainstream historical narrative here in that the Golden Age started around 800 CE. Now, what's fascinating about this is that after the advent of the Golden Age, many things started to happen within the Islamic sciences. And one of the first major milestones was that in 846 CE, Imam Bukhari completed his Sahih collection. And Sahih Bukhari is considered to be the most valid and authentic reference for Islamic knowledge, second only to the Quran itself. 
Now, before going into the implications behind this, uh, let's discuss yet another event that occurred shortly thereafter, and that was the founding of al Karawain Mosque by a woman patron by the name of Fatima al-Fihri. And this mosque is very special because it's considered to this day to be the oldest university and one of the oldest libraries that's still standing. Now, although today there are some historians who are questioning whether or not Fatima actually founded this mosque, the vast majority consider her to be the actual patron, and whether or not she actually did found the mosque, or it was only the individual who later facilitated it to become a university, the fact of the matter is, is that it showcases that historically within Islamic civilization, women played a very large part in education and supporting information literacy. Likewise, what it shows is that Muslims generally had no problem with women in education because even if she didn't found the mosque, or even if she didn't establish the university itself, the interesting thing is, is that for hundreds and hundreds of years, Muslims, especially men, took no issue crediting her with its founding and establishment. And in a moment, we'll see another example of a Muslim woman information scientist. And I won't ruin it for you just yet, but I just want my female viewers and my male viewers who have daughters to know that they should be very proud of the fact that there is a tradition of education and patronage of information literacy by women within Islamic history. Because without those women being patrons and being part of information literacy, the golden age would not have flourished as it did. But I don't want to digress too much, so let's move on to 864 CE when Imam Muslim completed his Sahih collection. In his collection, Sahih Muslim is considered to be the most authentic reference after Sahih Bukhari. So, within a span of 60 years, we see the codification of two of the most authentic compilations and hadith right after the advent of the Golden Age of Islam. And now the point that I want to make here is that these codification efforts by these traditional scholars who are considered to be extremely religious occur during a time when many historians today unfortunately still have this bias that the golden age of Islam began not in concordance with religious values but despite them. But that couldn't be further from the truth because much of the development of the Islamic sciences occurred during this time. So the question is, how is it that the Golden Age only came about as a result of apathy to religious values or on the basis of anti-religious sentiments, when in fact some of the greatest developments within the religious sciences themselves occurred at the very same time? The fact of the matter is, it doesn't make any sense. Now if we move a little bit farther ahead, and in a different geographical location, let's say 968 CE, a little bit after the founding of Al-Andalus, or Islamic Spain. And this is a very interesting time period because a caliph by the name of Al-Hakam II, the Caliph of Cordoba, decided to start his own translation movement and founded one of the greatest libraries of the world, the Library of Cordoba. And apparently this library was his personal collection, and it had over 500,000 books, and only rivaled by the House of Wisdom itself. So Al-Hakam II became another major patron of information literacy within Islamic civilization. And something else that was interesting about his library was that it was managed by a woman. And this is the example I wanted to bring up earlier, and the sister who managed those thousands of works was a woman by the name of Lubna al Cordoba. But what's interesting about that is that, again, a woman was put in charge over the knowledge of Al-Andalus. So imagine that no one could gain access to knowledge except through her because she was the gatekeeper. She was the individual who made sure that the population was educated. Because back then, again, libraries and universities were one and the same, right? So all of the scholars studied there and they relied on her to get them references and to manage the facility. So she played a very important role in information literacy during the very early period of the Andalusian Caliphate. So, I think that I've set up a few events within Islamic history to give you a better understanding of how information literacy fits within our history, and how important it was to the overall success of Islamic civilization, and in preserving our religion and developing Muslim intellectualism in general. However, let me briefly go over some negative events that occurred during our history as well. And this is during the 13th century when we start to see some obstacles that pave the way towards the decline of the golden age of Islamic civilization. So if we look just in the 13th century by itself, we find that the Reconquista of Al-Andalus was near its peak, and this was during the time that the European Catholics had begun reconquering Al-Andalus in the name of Europe and Christianity more specifically, and they were committing a great genocide against the Muslim population, and one of the first things that they did to facilitate this genocide was by burning the Library of Cordoba. So essentially the Spanish Catholics committed libricide on the Library of Cordoba, and this was actually done by Ferdinand III, 
and uh, they essentially destroyed the vast majority of that library and only preserved some of those texts for themselves. So essentially, not only did they destroy the heritage of Al-Andalus and the memories of the people who lived there, but they also stole much of the knowledge that was developed and produced by those very same Muslims. Now, unsurprisingly, shortly thereafter, the Mongols sacked Baghdad and also committed libricide on the House of Wisdom. So we lost two major libraries within a span of two decades in the 13th century. And this is just one among many factors that led to the decline of Islamic civilization. And most historians, even those of a more traditional Islamic perspective, essentially regard the 1500s or the 16th century as being when the Golden Age came to an end. So it's unsurprising that one of the major factors behind the decline of the Golden Age was the destruction of our libraries and our tradition of information science and information literacy. And the reason I bring this up is because it seems to me that many Muslims today not only do not value information literacy, but they don't even value libraries. And that's really unfortunate because during the Golden Age of Islam, it was information literacy and the library institution which facilitated that Golden Age and allowed us to become exemplars to the rest of the world for many, many centuries. So perhaps if we want to revive our civilization, we need to give more attention and focus not only to education, but information literacy and the information sciences. While I understand that professions like engineering and medicine and business are great for building status and carry with them great monetary value, the problem here is that these professions seem to be the only ones that Muslims really strive for. But Muslim professionals back then were not simply engineers and medical doctors. But today we tend to look down on people who choose professions other than the handful that many cultures have chosen to value prior to us even being born. So I just want to leave you with that thought uh, before moving on to the next section. Actually, prior to that, if you're wondering if there were any scholars who wrote about information literacy, there were in fact many. And in fact, we will be examining one of those texts in this very course. All right then, so let's move on to the relevance and importance of information literacy in the contemporary period. All right then, so let's move on to section four, the relevance and importance of information literacy in the contemporary period. And what I want to look at first is a quote by Akbar Ahmed in his book, Postmodernism and Islam, Predicament and Promise. And therein he talks about the current global media, Western media, and he states the following. Nothing in history has threatened Muslims like the Western media, neither gunpowder in the Middle Ages, which Muslims like Babar used with skill on the fields of Panipat, thus winning India for his Mughal dynasty, nor trains in the telephone, which helped colonize them in the last century, nor even planes which they mastered for their national airlines earlier this century. The Western media are ever-present and ubiquitous, never resting and never allowing respite. They probe and attack ceaselessly, showing no mercy for weakness or frailty. The powerful media offensive is compounded for Muslims. They appear not to have the capacity to defend themselves. Worse, they appear unable to comprehend the nature and objectives of the onslaught. So here he was writing in 1992 regarding Western media onslaught in terms of propaganda against Muslim minorities and the Muslim world at large. And he's not necessarily saying that the propaganda is causing physical harm or violence, but that it's causing violence to the reputation of Muslims in such a way that it's actually affecting uh, government policies, and it's affecting uh, the way in which Western countries and Westerners more specifically perceive and treat Muslims. And we as Muslims, because we're a minority, and also because we are lacking in certain things such as information literacy and necessary technology to fight against this propaganda, we are not able to push back on this propaganda. Propaganda. It's very difficult for us to control our own narrative. And I believe he's absolutely correct. Because today, information is what gives power. Information, understanding information, being able to process information, is in fact what makes us able to function in the contemporary context. So the fact that Muslims are lacking in this respect is a terrible problem. So we really do need to learn things like information literacy in order to fight against this propaganda. Moving on, another relevant aspect of information literacy can be found, of course, with the influence and impact of social media. So let's read a quote here from Lee McIntyre in his book Post-Truth, which is published by MIT Press, and he states the following. In a recent Pew poll, 62% of U.S. adults reported getting their news from social media, and 71% of that was from Facebook. This means that 44% of the total adult U.S. population now gets its news from Facebook. 
This reflects a sea of change in the source and composition of our news content. With the decline in vetting and editing, how are we supposed to know anymore which stories are reliable? While traditional news is still out there, it's getting harder and harder to tell what is the well-sourced fact-driven piece and what is not. And of course, some people just prefer to read and believe news that already fits their point of view anyway. So this is actually a massive problem because now we're seeing a transition from traditional news sources to social media where largely there is no vetting. Many news stories could literally be made up and you can see people actually sharing these things, making them viral without checking their contents. We've seen this on numerous occasions, right? And I think the best example is when we talk about Myanmar. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Rohingya genocide was actually started on Facebook. And what I mean by that is that the unchecked propaganda against Rohingya Muslims was actually initialized and developed and evolved on Facebook. So the reality is many people in Myanmar were convinced to commit genocide against the Rohingya population based on the propaganda they read from Facebook. Okay, so Facebook can have a great impact and can cause a lot of problems, especially for minorities, when a society is information illiterate, when they are susceptible to being influenced by propaganda. Okay, so we have to be very cognizant of this, and this is still a huge problem. Social media has actually exacerbated conspiracy theories and fake news and other such things, which have actually caused real-life damage to other people and to societies at large. But there are other factors at play here, not just a lack of information literacy, but also this understanding of oneself and the individual, which makes us believe, especially from the Western context, which has now become globalized in, in many respects, it makes us believe that one does not need to be an expert. The democratization of knowledge, as we call it. People no longer have to reference anything. People no longer have to look up their sources. Everyone is perceived, especially within secular liberal societies, as having the capacity to understand things at the same level as those who study formally, as those who actually research these subject matters. So, in other words, it has become fashionable to suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect. Everyone seems to think they're a genius these days, right? And this is what Tom Nichols discusses in his book, The Death of Expertise, the campaign against established knowledge and why it matters. And he says the following, These are dangerous times. Never have so many people had so much access to so much knowledge and yet have been so resistant to learning anything. In the United States and other developed nations, otherwise intelligent people denigrate intellectual achievement and reject the advice of experts. Not only do increasing numbers of lay people lack basic knowledge, they reject fundamental rules of evidence and refuse to learn how to make a logical argument. In doing so, they risk throwing away centuries of accumulated knowledge and undermining the practices and habits that allow us to develop new knowledge. And I think he's precisely correct. And we've discussed uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect earlier. Uh, and this is actually a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, the influence of the democratization of knowledge by secular liberal societies upon the rest of the world has caused people to easily fall for fake news and propaganda, which has also led to the rise of populism, especially in places like India and the United States. And speaking more about this is Michael Patrick Lynch in his book, Know It All Society. And here he's also writing about uh, U.S. culture, and he states the following. Our reliance on Google knowing turns out to feed our natural tendency to overinflate what we know. As a psychologist Matthew Fisher found in studying the relationship between internet searches and the illusion of explanatory depth, the result? Those who had searched the internet rated their ability to know answers to unrelated questions better than those who had not been allowed to search the internet. Merely searching the internet convinces people that they know more than they do, even about things they haven't researched at all. It is as if the sheer speed and ease of access of information on the internet causes us to lose track of how much we rely on it, thereby distorting how we view our own abilities. And that makes us think we know more than we do. So here he's discussing the Dunning-Kruger effect. And the internet actually makes the problem worse. Right, because we have all this access to knowledge and information, we suddenly believe that somehow now we know as much as experts because, you know, it just pops up on our screen immediately. Of course, without realizing that in order to get that information, somebody who we regard as an expert has to feed us that information. Yet nobody really cares about if that person is an expert or not. So the reality is, too, is kind of ironic, is that it's not so much that people reject expertise, is that they don't care who is an expert or who isn't. They are gullible with respect to what they're researching. Right. So they do accept expertise, only that they're the expert and the people who are feeding them the information are also experts. But when you correct these people and say, well, that person's not a doctor, they say it doesn't matter. They don't have to be a doctor. They can be an expert anyway. Right. So that's that's the real problem here. So it's really significant that in today's age, we have to learn information literacy to decipher who is actually an expert and who has actually learned on the subject and what expert knowledge actually looks like. Okay. 
We can't simply rely on Google to feed us the results because Google does not demarcate between expertise and a lay person's opinion on a blog. It only demarcates between which pages are viewed the most, uh, which pages are most popular, which pages are relevant to your interest, right? And this is problematic. However, information literacy also assists us in other ways as well, especially when it comes to the format and the medium of information. So for example, speaking on this issue, Nicholas Carr writes in his book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. Uh, he states the following with respect to the nature of the material that this information is printed on or not printed on. So he says the following, a page of online text viewed through a computer screen may seem similar to a page of printed text, but scrolling or clicking through a web document involves physical actions and sensory stimuli very different from those involved in holding and turning the pages of a book or magazine. Research has shown that the cognitive act of reading draws not just on our senses of sight, but also on our sense of touch. It's tactile as well as visual. All reading, writes Anne Mangin, a Norwegian literary studies professor, is multisensory. There is a crucial link between the sensory motor experience of the materiality of a written work and the cognitive processing of the text content. In other words, the shift from paper to screen doesn't just change the way we navigate a piece of writing, it also influences the degree of attention we devote to it and our depth of immersion. So what he's trying to say here actually is that the very material in which this information is stored actually causes us to be less attentive to that information. So when we examine information in the online space, in the virtual space, we are actually becoming more attention deficit. So we actually have to put in more effort to concentrate on the information we're consuming online. So information literacy helps us to do that. And finally, the other way in which information literacy is relevant and important in the contemporary period is that it helps us to understand history and also contemporary politics. And what do I mean by this? So, for example, in Rosie Bashir's book, Archive Wars, uh, she explains how the preservation of certain documents and historical sites plays a role in not only obviously understanding history, but also in constructing politics. So, for example, she states the following. Historical documents, archives, commemorative spaces, and the built environment are types of archives designed to tell a certain story about the past, as well as about futures that are in the making. As forms of political communication that knit across state and society, such technologies of knowledge production are evidentiary networks through which official historical knowledge moves and becomes visible, setting the stage for future historical narratives. But they are more than just spectacles whose salience lies in the symbolic power they hold. These monuments are also sites of capital accumulation that, in post-war Saudi Arabia, responded to looming economic and financial crises. They are central to the state's material politics and constitute the political economy of state-making. So here she's trying to make the argument that by preserving certain documents and historical sites, Saudi Arabia is able to make an identity for itself, is able to form its own political identity by erasing certain aspects of the past that contradict that identity and also forming a new future. So information literacy also helps us to comprehend how states, how nations, how cultures, and even how individuals form their own identities form their own understanding of history, and form their own understanding of the world. So this is a more complex point here, but I think it was important to note for those who enjoy or want to study history and politics. Okay? So with that, I wish to end the very first lesson of this course. And uh, before moving on um, to the next lesson, you do have some homework, and your homework is the following. First off, you are required to read chapter one of your textbook, especially if you want to complete the quiz. Uh, next, I want you to read Justin Parrott's article on information literacy, which should be linked in either the info box or your Moodle module. And you will need to read this article very carefully because some of the quiz questions relate to it as well. And finally, if you haven't already guessed, I want you to take the quiz. Now, for those of you who aren't in the Moodle module but still want to take the quiz, I've actually attached a copy in the information box on YouTube. However, in order to grade yourself, you're going to have to take the quiz and then go back into the lecture to see if the answers are correct. Um, because obviously there's no automatic grading with that. However, you can still download it and test your knowledge. So feel free to do so if you wish. And uh, with that said, I want to thank all of you for your patience and time, and I hope that you learned something today. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.